I think it is clear to believe in the power of ideas. Fresh, thank you for the Manhattan Institute. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Columbia University. It's really a great pleasure uh, to have you all here this morning on this gorgeous day for this conference, Thinking Big, New York and London, heading back to the top. If I had named it, I would have said staying on the top, because I know London and New York have no interest in leaving that perch. Columbia is really delighted to host the public session of this conference as part of the university's World Leaders Forum, initiated by our President Lee Bollinger, and as the inaugural session of the School of International and Public Affairs Global Mayors Forum. It's been a pleasure for us to be in partnership with the Manhattan Institute and the Regional Plan Association in organizing today's session and a special thank you, of course, to Julia Vitulo Martin and Hope Cohen from, for everything they've done uh, to make this day and the last several days possible. And a very special welcome to our two mayors. Mayor Mike, the hometown favorite, and Mayor Boris Johnson have really shown what it means to be true world leaders and have shown what it means to accomplish in a very difficult time uh, in our, our nations, in the globe's situation right now because of the economic recession. And we are so pleased to inaugurate the Global Mayors Forum with the mayors of London and New York. But I have to tell everybody in this room, and it's a very special pleasure for me to welcome Michael Bloomberg. New York City has been very lucky to have Michael Bloomberg as the head of state for the past eight years. When we faced one of the darkest times in our city's history, he led us through to the light, demonstrating to the world that freedom, democracy, community spirit, and good old-fashioned capitalism could truly triumph over violence and terror. Thank you, Mayor Mike, for all you have done for the city of New York. Some of you might be thinking why we are talking in the context of a global economic crisis about cities. And some of you might be thinking what cities can do in the face of these, in this extraordinary time. A very wise man of American politics, former Speaker of the House Tip O'Neill once said, all politics are local. And in fact, that's absolutely true. Mayors are playing an increasingly important role in solving the globe's problem, whether it will be this economic crisis whether it is the warming of the globe, what is, whether it is poverty alleviation, you will see the solutions coming from our globe's great cities. And I have to add to that that the role of the university is becoming increasingly important in the globalization of the world and in our quest to solve these kinds of problems. And President Lee Bollinger and our Dean of the School of Columbia School of International and Public Affairs, John Coatsworth, have really been leading in this. Columbia is deeply engaged in the life of the city and the globe. Within the city, Columbia is really, and it's hard to imagine, one of the largest and most stable employers here, and has long, of course, been a generator of ideas that have improved the life here and around the globe. From the engineers who design our basic infrastructure, to generations of writers and artists who shape our culture, to our climate scientists who are now helping the mayor make Plan NYC a reality and make our city more sustain sustainable, our applied technology experts work with the city to maintain its leadership in the media and in tourism. 
uh, people actually come up to Morningside Heights in those buses that annoy many of us, but we are so delighted to see you all here when you come. And of course, we teach and train generations of young people. I want to welcome my class, uh, my SEPA seminar in Urban Politics and Policy, who are here this morning to join us. They were lucky to get in. We turned away over 300 students, unfortunately, this morning, who wanted to be here. And we teach and train students in every field who grow up in, in our city and who are educated here and then build their lives and careers all across the globe. And we take very seriously our identity as Columbia University in the city of New York. And while we consider ourselves a global leader, we also understand our role as citizen of this great city. And I want to say one brief word about the School of International and Public Affairs. I know many of you are familiar with this school, which is the oldest public policy school in the country. We are truly a global school. 50% of our students are international, and 16,000 graduates, graduates are living in more than 150 countries across the globe. And they are leaders in cities, whether it's London, Paris, Singapore, Beijing, Sao Paulo, Mexico City. You will find a SEPA graduate somewhere across this globe, and you will know that they are well-educated. They will be problem solvers, not problem creators. And my final word is very simple. We are here partly because uh, SEPA has decided to inaugurate a global mayor's forum, as I said. And this is, I think, a very, very important thing that we can do in our collaboration, in our partnership, in focusing on solutions rather than problems. I learned that from Mayor Mike. It's always about the solution, never really about the problem. And we are really very proud to welcome these two great mayors to inaugurate this city. I want to finally thank Commissioner Marjorie Tiven uh, from the Mayor's Office of the United Nations and Protocol, who helped make this uh, conference possible. And of course, welcome all the commissioners and all our guests from London. We'll be hearing from Amanda Burden in the next conference, Commissioner of Planning. And we have our Commissioner Ray Kelly from the Police Department here. I know um, Deputy Mayor Lieber is here, and, I'm, and um, Commissioner Saida Khan from the Transportation Department. I'm sure I'm leaving people out. You'll all forgive me. But it's really very important that they're here and part of this conference because it demonstrates their commitment, as I said, to finding solutions to these problems. We need these commissioners in this city more than ever now, and we are very lucky to have that team in place. I am delighted to welcome Larry Moan from the Manhattan Institute to the podium, who will provide greetings from the Manhattan Institute. Have a great time today. Thank you, Esther, and, and thank you all for coming today, where, where I'm sure will be an enlightening discussion. Let me begin by thanking Columbia's President Lee Bollinger and his team for hosting us today in this remarkable and beautiful building. I also want to thank our other intellectual partner today, the Regional Plan Association. The RPA's president, Robert Yower, and his staff have played a great role in the development of today's conference, and we greatly appreciate their involvement. Today's Thinking Big conference is the second in a series. Our first Thinking Big forum took place two years ago in November of 2007. At the time, construction was booming, the city was running a surplus, its bond rating had hit an all-time high, and the Bloomberg administration had just laid out a far-sighted, multi-decade plan to enhance the city's economic and physical development. Today, we meet under far different circumstances. And with both New York and London at the epicenter of the financial market meltdown, there is a real need for serious, pragmatic, nonpartisan solutions to the challenges that confront both cities. We should remember, however, that New York and London have both overcome far greater challenges in the past. From the London Blitz to 9-11, Londoners and New Yorkers have risen to the occasion time and time again. Indeed, perhaps that one feature binds our two cities more than any other, and that's the resilience of its citizens. 
I think Mayor Bloomberg put it best when he said recently, quote, the fact is every city creates its own future. If you believe you're at the mercy of larger forces beyond your control, you've already lost. Those larger forces affect every city, but successful cities learn how to adapt. The Manhattan Institute is working hard to offer up new ideas that can help the city adapt to the new economic realities we face. We recently published a special edition of our quarterly city journal called New York's Tomorrow that was devoted to the challenges facing New York City and state during this difficult period. And I'm pleased that one of the articles in the package, senior fellow Nicole Gelinas' analysis of the MTA was referenced in Mayor Bloomberg's recently released plan to improve the city's mass transit. We're delighted to have helped organize this forum to share ideas on how London and New York can emerge from the current crisis and go on to new levels of prosperity. New York and London have long been the dominant market-driven democratic Western cities, and we must now work together and learn from one another to climb back up to the top. This conference is an opportunity to kick that effort off in a big way. And we're especially honored that the mayors of two of the world's greatest cities, Mayor Michael Bloomberg and Mayor Boris Johnson, could take time out of their schedules to be with us today. It is somehow fitting that we're holding this conference the week after we celebrated the 400th anniversary of the first Englishman's arrival in New York. I assume that Mayor Johnson's journey across the pond was a bit less arduous than Henry Hudson's, and I hope that it ends better. I believe Hudson's crew later mutinied on him, but we sincerely thank Mayor Johnson and his staff for making the trip and for participating not only in this conference today, but in a series of smaller working meetings that the Institute has organized throughout the week. I also want to thank Mayor Bloomberg and his staff for participating. Although the challenges facing New York today are great, it is easy to forget that Mayor Bloomberg was elected just a few weeks after the 9-11 terrorist attacks. With the ruins of the World Trade Center still smoldering, many predicted a return to the bad old days when businesses and residents fled the city in droves. But in fact, just the opposite has occurred. Crime is down, graduation rates and test scores are up, and development has continued, even in the face of the recent economic difficulties. So thank you, Mr. Mayor, for your leadership and your eagerness to continue to seek out the new ideas that will push New York to even greater heights. So let me just close by again thanking our mayors and everyone else for your participation today. We look forward to an exchange of ideas and building lasting working relationships. And now I will turn the proceedings over to my colleague, Julia Vitula Martin, who along with Hope Cohen has worked very hard over the past several months to organize today's conference. Please join me in welcoming Julia Vitula Martin. Thank you, Larry. Um, I'd like, I'm Julia Vitulo Martin, Director of the Center for Rethinking Development and a Senior Fellow at the Manhattan Institute. And I'm going to get the Mike and Boris show underway immediately, but I'd like to begin by thanking uh, the conference's supporters and funders, the Rockefeller Foundation, the Daniel and Joanna Rose Fund, the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, and the British Consulate General in New York for their generous contributions, and Columbia University, Covington and Burling, and Excel Development Corporation for their in-kind support, which made this conference possible. Um, this is, as Larry Moan noted, our second Thinking Big conference, the first having been confined only to New York. The inspiration for our title, uh, Heading Back to the Top, came in part from a business conference um, held by Cranes last year, which used a telling phrase, the race to the bottom. The bottom, we thought, is not where New Yorkers want to be or Londoners. The two cities are alike in so many ways, similar in size, demographics, economic development, zeitgeist, and the resilience of their peoples. But the two cities have very different political structures and very different relationships to their national governments. New York's mayoralty is old. Mayor Bloomberg is our 108th mayor, while London's mayoralty is young. Boris Johnson is only their second mayor. This is the converse, of course, of the age of the two cities, since London, Londinium, is centuries older than New York and was itself the dominant world city when New York was still struggling to figure out what it was going to be. Mayor Bloomberg was born in Boston, Mayor Johnson in New York. Thus, neither mayor is native to the city over which he presides, 
but this seems uh, rather right for two cities that are so energetic and mobile. Um, when, uh, back when Tony Blair was thinking about how to structure a London mayoralty, he often talked about what he called a New York-style mayor. He couldn't actually deliver a New York-style mayor structurally for all sorts of reasons, but astonishingly, the London system seems to have delivered New York-style mayors in practice. Boris Johnson's predecessor reminded an awful lot of people of our own Ed Koch, and Mayor Johnson himself, with his very quick wit, could certainly be at home here. In fact, the diversity of Mayor Johnson's ethnic heritage, French, German, Turkish, British, uh, makes him uh, what in the old days would have been called a walking one-man Board of Estimate ticket. And as Dan Rose uh, mentioned the other night, uh, with his quick wit and his ethnic diversity, um, this is a guy who could get elected in the Bronx. So um, please, uh, let's give a very warm welcome to our own New York Mayor, Mayor Bloomberg, and London's New York style Mayor, Mayor Johnson. Good morning. Thank you. Julia, thank you, and uh, welcome to one of the great universities in the whole world uh, that is enjoying good weather. The mayor will take full credit for the weather. Lee Bollinger will take full credit for the uh, writings of the faculty of this university. It's a joke, folks. Uh, let me thank, to start out by thanking Lee and the Columbia University Hull community for hosting us today and all the groups that have generously supported the conference and also its organizers, the Manhattan Institute, the Regional Plan Association and Columbia School of International and Public Affairs, Global Mayors Forum and also Columbia's World Leaders Forum. Uh, a good friend is overseeing Columbia's role in this conference, Professor Esther Fuchs, who you heard from before. Uh, during my first term in office, she was my special advisor at City Hall. Uh, Esther did indeed have advice for me. If you know her, she has advice for everyone. Uh, sometimes I even followed that advice, and usually I was glad when I did. Um, I did want to thank uh, you all for coming out today to see and listen to a native son of New York. A little known thing, but Boris Johnson was born right here in New York City. He only lived here briefly, but if you listen very carefully while he's talking, you can still hear some traces of a New York accent. When I was in London about a year ago, they honored me with the freedom of the city, a venerable distinction entitling me to drive cattle over London Bridge and also to carry a naked sword in public. Although when I was thinking about this this morning, perhaps it was a sword naked. I got to check on that before I go home. Uh, more to the point, London and New York have long been friendly rivals. It's a special relationship that dates back from when it took a month to sail between the two cities, and it's even stronger today when we're linked by more than 30 flights a day and uh, when 1.3 million visitors from the UK come to New York every single year and when New York's British expat community numbers in the many thousands, uh, some of whom are here with us today. Both our cities have endured deadly terrorist attacks, and we also cooperate very effectively in our counterterrorism strategies. And 12 months ago, uh, both New York and London were also hit at exactly the same time by what began as a crisis in the housing markets and morphed into the biggest global financial crisis in 75 years. Uh, no matter what some people think, we are in this together and the solutions to our problems are only going to be found, I think, by working together. Now, in any economic downturn, fiscal discipline is City Hall's primary duty, and while virtual, so, virtually no one foresaw such a huge collapse, collapse here in New York, uh, as you know, we'd already begun tightening city government's belt in 2007 
at the first hints of economic slowdown and the gap uh, closing measures that began then and continue today have really had a cumulative total impact of more than $30 billion in reducing our expenses. We also did what governments really do. We saved surpluses generated during the preceding boom years instead of squandering them, and that has allowed us to keep the city's budget balanced without gutting critical services to work that make a difference in our quality of life and our economic competitiveness. We're not out of the woods yet, as we all know, uh, and that makes continued fiscal discipline essential and remaining at the top of an ever more competitive global economy also means that we've got to, while at the same time we're exercising fiscal conservatism and judgment, we are thinking big. Uh, there's a lot about the economy that we can't control. Uh, the days when cities could just pass the buck to their national governments, I think, are over. Our national government can't afford to bail out all the cities in our country, and our state government certainly can't afford to bail out all the cities in our state. So the cities, more than ever before, are going to have to look out for themselves. Now, cities, the good news is, have become proving grounds for new ideas that make government services more nimble and accountable and people have come to expect their mayors to be problem solvers who can bring once out of control crime under control, who can turn dysfunctional school systems around, and who can solve other seemingly intractable problems. Uh, now New York and London too can have the same success creating jobs and strengthening our economy by thinking big and taking innovative new approaches. And you'll hear from Boris Johnson, he really does think outside the box, he is innovative. He is creative, and he's not uh, one of these people that says, not invented here. Boris is willing to listen to everybody and anybody. And when the ideas fit London, he has not been shy about uh, implementing them, which is why Boris Johnson is very well loved in London. Uh, people think he's doing a good job, and from what my friends tell me, he really is. Um, New York's economy, uh, economic recovery strategy, has three elements, and uh, they're slightly different than what they're doing in London, but uh, basically uh, going down the same paths, and I just wanted to uh, point out all three of them. Uh, the first, while it may seem counterintuitive during a deep national recession, uh, New York is re making the major and smart investments in our city's future. And that's why over the next four years, in spite of the economic downturn, we plan to invest in our infrastructure more than in any four-year period in our history. Uh, take, for example, the $2.1 billion extension of the number seven line to the far, subway line to the far west side. That will spur economic development there, just as Prime Minister's uh, Thatcher and Major's extension of London's Jubilee line to Canary Wharf created a thriving new business district there. Now, there are people that say we can't afford these kinds of investments, but the fact is we can't afford in tough times not to make these kinds of investments. Now is exactly the time when we need to build in public works and in the private sector as well, because building now will put winning cards in the city's hands when the national economy rebounds. And although development always entails risk-taking, I think New York is as safe a real estate bet as you can find today. I can just tell you in my company just took another 140,000 square feet of space in our city that became available. Contiguous space, it's never going to be available again. Uh, this is one of the unique opportunities, I think, to make investments for the future. The second big thought that I wanted to highlight today is our in our economic recovery strategy is diversification. And once again, it's at the bottom of the economic cycle, not at the top, when the time is most ripe for new ideas and enterprises. A silver lining in Wall Street's contraction is that a lot of ambitious and talented people who, instead of working in big firms, are instead now striking out on their own. Our job is to foster that entrepreneurial spirit because we believe strongly in what economist Edward Glazer wrote in the recent New York Tomorrow issue of the Manhattan Institute's City Journal. The future belongs to cities like New York and London 
that are magnets for just such creative and enterprising men and women. And that's precisely why last February, when the recession was snowballing downhill, we began setting up business incubators for new startups in a broad array of industries, including fashion, film, information technology, media, and financial services. And it's also why we've reduced state unincorporated business taxes that for far too long have been a financial disincentive and a financial millstone around the necks of our city's freelancers and independent contractors. And it's why we're providing job retraining grants for employees in a wide range of small businesses so that they develop the new skills that will give them and their employers a competitive edge. It's also why we're continuing to create neighborhood business improvement districts. And in that regard, London is flattering us by taking a page from our book. And later this morning, Boris and I will jointly encourage economic diversity in our cities by signing a cooperative marketing agreement that gives a big shot in the arm to an industry key to both London and New York, and that is tourism. The success we've already had in diversifying our economy is why, as tough as the recession has been, we've actually been weathering it much better than many predicted. A year ago, most forecasts were that we would have lost 200,000 jobs by now. Well, instead, the numbers seem to suggest that we've lost only 95,000. That's a lot, and that's 95,000 people that need our help, but it sure beats the alternative. Financial services will always be crucial to our economy, but strengthening and expanding other industries protects us from Wall Street's roller coaster boom and bust cycles. And we've been working on this for the last seven years. Thank goodness we've been doing it. I don't think you can ever do it enough. We love when one industry makes a lot of money and pays a lot of taxes. But the bottom line is each of these industries, whether it's Wall Street or any other one, are cyclical industries. And we have to have the diversification that will protect us when any one industry is not generating the kind of jobs and tax revenues that this city needs. The third and final big thought in our economic recovery strategy is to make our city more affordable for people of all income levels. Like the first two, it's closely tied to facts on the ground here and now. And the most salient fact about New York today is that despite the national recession, our city's population is at a record high. Uh, it's 8.4 million people and growing. The people choosing to come here or stay here are casting a big vote of confidence in our future, and we want to reward those decisions, especially for those struggling to climb into the middle class. And that's why, for example, we're moving ahead on our affordable housing plan that will create or preserve housing for half a million New Yorkers by the year 2013, and on rezoning so that are opening up new areas to private developers. It's why we've proposed to make public transportation more affordable and free cross-town buses by making half-price Long Island Railroad fares available to more riders within the city. And it's why we're also working to increase the affordability of community colleges uh, in our city. New York, as you should know, are enrolling in community colleges in record numbers. And they understand how valuable education is. And earning a community college diploma actually, statistics show, raises your income an average of about $8,500 a year. So it certainly is a good investment. It also creates the skilled, educated workforce that our economy needs so that companies, when they want to locate here or grow here, will be able to find the employees that will make their businesses a success. So in short, promoting such affordability really is a win for everyone. A city that's affordable and attractive, an economy that is diverse and growing, a strong commitment to maintaining and modernizing our infrastructure, those are the elements of our five borough economic opportunity plan to pull New York out of a national recession as quickly as possible. Uh, we've set an ultimate goal of preserving and creating 400,000 jobs by 2015. Um, does anybody have any doubts that we can do it? Well, Boris taught me a phrase when somebody asked that. Forget about it. This is New York, and if we keep thinking big and keep having the courage to take on the toughest challenges, then the best days for this city are still to come. And my next job is to try to explain to Boris why Brooklyn's, Brooklynites and Marty Markowitz says, forget about it. 
anyways, uh, the best days for the city, I really think, are yet to come. And the healthy competition between us and London really does benefit both our cities. And uh, it's been my pleasure to get to know Boris over the last um, year or so. And um, he is uh, the kind of leader that I think London needs. He's refreshingly candid. Um, he's bigger than life, which is good in the mayor. Uh, he's willing to uh, take ideas and, if they apply, implement them and stand up for what he thinks is right. London is very well served with this guy. Julia, you're going to introduce him? Say good things about him. Way to go. Thank you. Um, so our next speaker, uh, Alexander Boris de Pfeffer Johnson, uh, Mayor of London, New York style of New York style Mayor of London, will tell us how he intends to secure London's position at the top. Mayor Johnson. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. Thank you, Mike, very much. Thank you, Julia. Uh, thank you, everybody, for coming along. And, uh, Mike, I want to begin with thanks to you for your outstanding generosity and uh, uh, all of your team that have uh, helped us so much in the, in the last uh, few days. And, of course, I want to congratulate you in a, in a reciprocal way upon your achievements, which I have admired uh, from afar for a, for a long time. And uh, I don't know uh, quite uh, how far any praise from me would actually boost your your popularity in, in the current uh, circumstances, Mike. Uh, but let me just say, I'm sure that I will be admiring those achievements for a long time to come. And uh, I want to say how, how pleased I am actually to be back here in Colombia. When I say back here in Colombia, uh, you ought to know that this is the first academic institution, ladies and gentlemen, that I ever visited. Absolutely true. Uh, I, 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 for, for the simple reason that, as uh, Mike uh, accurately says, I was born in this city, and I, I wanted to be close to my mother at the time, clearly. And I came here as a babe in arms, I'm told, and indeed it may have been that experience that gave me a lifelong knack of sleeping through lectures and uh, tutorials. Uh, and so really it's, it's as a, a native New Yorker with an instinctive attachment to this wonderful city that I will therefore resist any of the arid uh, chauvinistic claptrap about the supremacy of London. Uh, and it would be indelicate in this, uh, in this uh, confines here in Columbia uh, to mention that London has more top 100 universities than any city on earth and more international students and that we have more top law firms and more top PR firms, more top advertising agencies, more international tourists than any other city in the world. Uh, and with an output of 251 billion pounds, we have an economy considerably bigger uh, than those of Sweden or Austria and twice the size of Denmark. And I'm certainly not going to stand before you now and crow about the triumph of Billy Elliot in winning 10 Tony Awards. Uh, and I will, I will not, I will not rub in, I will not, it will, far be it for me to rub in our success in winning the Olympic Games uh, for London. Uh, because I know, I know, I know, uh, I know in a, in a congenital way, in a congenital way, uh, I know the uh, rival genius of this fantastic city. And I hope that today we can at least agree on this, ladies and gentlemen, that together London and New York, and New York stand high up in the list of the top two greatest cities on earth. Yes? And uh, with all the challenges uh, that we face and with all that we have in common, I think this is rather the time for us to learn from each other and to exchange ideas and initiatives as we have so often in the past. And that is why I congratulate the Manhattan Institute uh, on having uh, this conference. Uh, after all, uh, we gave you uh, Billy Elliot, uh, you gave us hairspray, we gave you mad cow disease, you gave us swine flu, you gave us the subprime disaster, we gave you a plan to spend trillions bailing out the banks, and it is, therefore, in that context of transatlantic intellectual intimacy uh, that I know that you will recognize and understand some of the problems, uh, some of the challenges that we have in London. We have a fiscal crisis caused by chronic government profligacy. We have a financial services industry in shock. We have a serious housing shortage. We have antiquated Victorian infrastructure. We have a planet visibly 
but palpably heating up, not like everybody in this room. And to cap it all, we have a population boom in London, a fact you may not be aware of. Yes, comrades, uh, comrades, thanks to the heroic efforts of the London mothers, uh, we expect our population to grow from about 7.6 million now uh, to uh, roughly 9 million, we think, in 2031. And before you get too alarmed about this increase, I should remind you that London previously accommodated uh, such numbers in 1939 before the Blitz and in uh, 1961, again before the great uh, flights to Essex and, and other places. Uh, but this time, when we face that population growth, we need to make our city function more beautifully without overcrowding and urban blight. And when we build our new housing stock at the rate of 36,000 a year over the life of the London plan, we are not going to build homes for hobbits, my friends, uh, because the dimensions of the average British buttock, uh, which is the key determinant in, in, in room size, uh, are, are now second only uh, to the dimensions, and Sir Stuart Lipton will confirm this, are second only now uh, to the dimensions of the average American uh, buttock. And that is why I have, I, uh, I have insisted in the new London plan on a new and improved uh, set of space standards. Uh, we are going up to what's called Parker Morris plus 10. And we do not intend to build uh, more soulless rabbit hutch high rises for our people, but to make use of the abundant uh, brownfield sites at our disposal. And with so many more young people uh, coming uh, into our schools, it is more vital than ever that the city raises its game and intervenes uh, to improve skills. And so that's why I, I've been very, very impressed with what Mike has done uh, here in New York. And I'm uh, the first mayor in our constitution uh, to be actively promoting academies specifically designed to get school leavers into employment. And at a time of real pressure on, uh, on both the city and on national budgets, we need to avoid the critical mistake of cutting back now on big transport infrastructure projects that will not only deliver jobs and growth now, but make our city uh, more attractive uh, in the long term. And that's why we're going ahead uh, with uh, the Crossrail, a massive program to uh, build a, uh, uh, a link between Heathrow and the city that will increase London's rail capacity by 10%, huge upgrades of the tubes, 30% increase in capacity with air conditioning for the first time on the London Underground. How about that? Come to London next year and uh, on some trains you'll find air conditioning for the first time. Uh, we are building a gigantic, super colossal uh, cloaca maxima underneath the Thames called the Thames Tideway Tunnel, a vast uh, system that will deal with the unmentionable consequences of what happens when uh, the basal jet interceptors overflow and give us for the first time uh, the prospect of a clean river uh, throw, flowing through the heart of London. And the point of doing this is to mobilize people into work now at a very, very difficult time for our city. Obviously, that's important. But of course, to make sure that we are more attractive and more competitive in the long term and for generations to come. And the second mistake we've got to avoid, and, and Mike has uh, already alluded to it, I think uh, no matter what our rage against the bankers may be, and no matter how justified that, uh, that uh, feeling of rage uh, may be, we must avoid the mistake of needlessly introducing regulations that will not punish the guilty, but simply hamper the economic competitiveness of both our cities. And I do worry that, without naming any names, certain uh, European governments and administrators have understandably seized on this moment of crisis uh, to dust down directives that would not only be protectionist, uh, in, in, in effect, in attacking the transatlantic link between firms established both in London and in, in New York, but would actually end up driving those businesses outside the European Union to Geneva or, 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 or Asia. And, and, and the, you know, the best uh, rejoinder I can give to people thinking of, uh, of going in, in advance of this is, of course, have you ever spent a night on the town in Geneva? Uh, and I, that, I find, is our, our, at the moment our most powerful argument. <laughs> I do hope, Mike, I do hope that we can work together uh, to produce more sensible regulation, because we do need more sensible regulation. I hope that we can help the bankers to show their obligations to wider society in the way that I think that they need to do, and not just cart off great big new taxpayer-funded uh, bonuses. 
uh, but I also think that we need to preserve the vital strength of our financial services industry. And, of course, it is our job to prepare for the shrinkage of that industry which the pessimists are predicting and which we're seeing. Now, I can't stand before you here in this great academic institution and uh, announce that, you know, which sectors of the London economy I think will be strongest in, in 30 years' time. I can't, I cannot, I cannot tell. That, that kind of thing went out, thankfully, with, with Stalin. Uh, but what I can say is that London will be at the cutting edge of whatever industry adds the most value and depends on the highest levels of skills. And in the 16th century, it was wool. Yeah, it was the wool trade. In the 17th century, it was saddles and silk. In the 18th century, it was tea, uh, upon which some uh, people mysteriously refused to pay tax. Uh, in the 19th century, in the 19th century, it was shipbuilding. Uh, in the 20th century, we did everything from Hoovers to Fords to banking to insurance. And in the 21st century, I cannot help but notice the fantastic strength and resilience of the London uh, cultural arts uh, media uh, sectors. Uh, and of course, our amazing, I, think we, I, I think we have considerably more Wi-Fi hotspots than New York. I don't want, this wasn't meant to be another chauvinist uh, point. We have considerably more, uh, we are more uh, electronically branché, uh, if I can use a French word, uh, uh, than, uh, than New York. Than New York. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, I am very, very proud of the continuing resilience of London manufacturing. We, have, we make uh, bicycles in London, many bicycles. We not only ride them, we make them. And uh, I'm very pleased that uh, I read the other day that there is a, a firm in Walthamstow, a wonderful borough. How many have been, people have been to Walthamstow? Not enough. Fantastic place. In Walthamstow, there is a, there is a company uh, that every year is exporting five million pounds worth of chocolate cake and brownies. And ladies and gentlemen, where do you think those brownies and chocolate cake are going? Not New York. Even better. They are going to France, ladies and gentlemen. The, the French, uh, they are. They are buying our cake in, they are buying our cake uh, by the shed load, uh, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, I salute them. And I, all I would say really to, uh, to, to Nicola, uh, to, to President Sarkozy, uh, is that before he has any further designs on our financial services industry, he should look to his cake industry. And uh, I say to the people of France, let them eat cake, uh, provided it is made in Walthamstow. Uh, but of course, there is one sector, there is one sector of, uh, of the economy uh, that uh, are, whose growth and whose development, uh, I'm sure Mike would agree with this, whose growth and whose development does require political leadership and initiative, and that is uh, in tackling the environment and climate change. And we saw what happened with the heat wave of 2003 when there were 2,000 excess deaths in London. We must be prepared uh, for those conditions to become the norm, and that's why we are pioneering uh, measures to cut London's CO2 emissions uh, by 60% by 2025, retrofitting people's homes, putting in cladding, insulation, lagging, as it's called, lagging. London may be lagging in some things, but it's not going to be lagging in lagging, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, by sponsoring uh, new carbon zones by which neighbours compete with each other to drive down uh, their CO2 emissions by uh, 2012. And our intention in City Hall is to harness the great energy of the Olympics and our duty to make our city ready uh, to deliver significant changes and improvements in the look and feel of living and moving around in London. And that's why we're bringing in a cycle hire scheme with uh, a first wave of 6,000 wonderful new bikes, new cycle superhighways, and I much admire some of the things I've seen, Mike, in New York, uh, and a, a wholesale attempt, a wholesale attempt to decarbonize our transport system, planting far more trees on our streets, encouraging electric vehicles, and of course, uh, last but not least, introducing a new, cleaner, greener, lightweight, uh, low carbon, uh, new bus for London, replacing the wonderful uh, hop on, hop off, fall over uh, feature of the old buses that was so beloved 
our, our by Londonism, which was such a vital feature of all the Hollywood iconography uh, of London, and which, in my view, was so wrongly uh, taken away uh, from our city. And so we will be bringing that back. Mike, I just want to say, in conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, I know, although the, you know, the London mayoralty is not yet, not yet, blessed with all the powers of the mayoralty of New York. And I think it's possible that I have slightly more discretion over some planning things and over some transport uh, decisions. Uh, I have to say, I bow in awe of the Olympian authority uh, of a man who, with a stroke of a pen, can ban smoking and indeed, I'm told, margarine or some forms of, of margarine. Absolutely, and a, quite ast astounding. That is power, uh, ladies, ladies and gentlemen. I, I, I salute you. I salute you for that. Uh, but nonetheless, I am confident that with this program, which I hope uh, commends itself to you as, as well as to the people of London, I am confident that we can ensure that London emerges stronger and improved uh, from this recession. And if we can work together, ladies and gentlemen, to share ideas, I know that New York and London will continue to show the energy, the entrepreneurial spirit, the generosity of heart, and the dynamism that makes them admired around the world and makes them the two best big cities in the world to live in. Though obviously, I'm far too polite to announce now in which order they come. Thank you very, very much uh, for listening to me. And I hope in view of the uh, recent uh, travails of the pound against the dollar that we will see you in London before too long. Thank you. I think it is clear how fortunate we are to believe in the power of ideas. Supply the common sense and the fresh thinking of the Manhattan Institute.